lot of disagreements with Richard Gage's video, Blueprint for Truth. So far, I've listed 65 of them. Next is his claim that the Twin Towers came down at near freefall acceleration, and that this is evidence of controlled demolition. Unfortunately for me, he has a little bit of support from NIST as well. They say the first exterior panels hit the ground in 9 to 11 seconds, and that a precise calculation of the collapse timing of the building itself can't be determined because of all that dust. So all this tells us is that the outside panels, the ones that were not being slowed down by the building itself, came down in free fall. That doesn't tell us very much. They stopped their investigation at the point of inevitability of collapse because they were studying the cause of the collapse and that then they could make their safety recommendations. The effect of the collapse initiation to them was building, gravity, collapse. They didn't really give it much thought. Richard condemns the NIST report for stopping at the initiation of collapse. He says, quote, there is no model of a collapse. Why didn't they do it? Could it be because they knew darn well it could not have collapsed at all? It's exactly the opposite. They knew darn well the building had nowhere to go but down. I told them at NIST I wish they had studied the collapse itself more because it would have helped with some of the details I had to research. Well, more research on their part would have also shown that there was no freefall collapse of the towers. But the final result was, like they said, gravity brought it down. In fact, researchers in the 9-11 Truth Movement itself have stated that the collapse towers for the Twin Towers was around 15 seconds. In addition, MIT professor Thomas Iger said most of the building fell at two-thirds of free fall in around 15 seconds. So researchers on both sides seem to agree on that rough figure. And I submit that the slower collapse rate shows significant resistance to the momentum of the collapse and is yet another reason to believe the natural collapse theory. The towers did not collapse at almost free fall speed. As NIST told me personally, quote, the momentum, which equals mass times velocity, of the 12 or 28 stories falling on the supporting structure below so greatly exceeded the strength capacity of the structure below that it couldn't stop the falling mass. The downward momentum felt by each successive lower floor was even larger due to the increasing mass. The two towers did provide structural resistance, and the stronger core came to the ground last, standing for up to 25 seconds after the start of the initial collapse before they too fell apart. Core columns broke mostly at the welded connections every 36 feet. In Blueprint for Truth, Richard says, quote, to bring a building symmetrically down, what we have to do is remove the core columns. But the stronger core columns came down last in this case. So if there were any kind of controlled demolition, then detonating the core structure and causing its collapse first would always be the priority, or demolition would not work right at all. If I said I was earning almost 100000 a year when I was earning only 67 k you'd think I was exaggerating. So Richard can't say the towers fell at almost free fall speed when it was only two-thirds of free fall. There's a very big difference. So the $100,000 question for Richard Gage and me is which force wins in the monumental battle between gravitational momentum and structural strength? I say gravity won, but it had to fight and overcome the strong steel structure of the building floor by floor. Richard says the strong structure should have won and could have lost only with the help of controlled demolition, knocking out the support. Here's the simple formula that shows why most engineers believe that gravity won. In two seconds, free fall descent speed is 45 miles per hour because force equals mass times acceleration. At 9.8 meters per second, per second, a 10 million pound floor slams into the floor below it at 98 million pounds worth of force. I made a little video demonstrating the power of gravity. The scale can measure 300 pounds and it has a 25 pound weight on it. I'll drop that weight from about half a story so we can see if we can get a measurement. The formula is force equals mass times acceleration, so gravity increases the force almost tenfold in the first second alone. The towers weighed about 580 million pounds. F.R. Greening said, but that was a lot of gravitational momentum, with 14 or 29 floors above the collapse, up to 180 million pounds, traveling at over 100 miles per hour. With each successive floor at more momentum and millions of net additional pounds, overwhelming the resistance of the support structure. The scale has been destroyed before it can even measure the weight of this falling object. So 7 to 14 times the structural load of the building during the collapse Eduardo Cassell, in September 2001, wrote, As they gained momentum, their crushing descent became unstoppable. The fall down the height of a single floor must have created dynamic forces exceeding the design loads by more than 10 times. 
My scale was destroyed before it even gave us a weight. I'm sure you can make this into a repeatable experiment of sorts. Richard is just not giving gravity enough respect. It appears to me that some of the calculations of the strength of the Twin Towers don't take into account what happens to the static strength of steel columns under the stress of a collapse. A steel column or beam will resist at full power only until it deforms by about 1%, and then it fractures, and its strength goes to near zero. The average strength during the collapse is a tiny fraction of its static strength. In solid mechanics, they speak of a parameter called toughness, the work required to fracture or otherwise destroy a piece of material. This is the quantity one needs to estimate, and it's a great deal less than the static strength of each member times its length. Richard Gage also claims that the collapse of the three World Trade Center buildings was nearly symmetrical into its own footprint, and says this is further evidence of controlled demolition because a natural collapse would have been messier. Here is the most dramatic proof that there was nothing symmetrical about the collapse of the South Tower. This is yet another example of how, as Richard said in his video, the collapse shows all the characteristics of a classic controlled demolition, except when it doesn't. But Richard tries to turn this 22 degree tilt in the South Tower to his advantage by claiming that only controlled demolition could have stopped the building top from falling over once the angular momentum of the tipping began. Let's see if this is true. All three of the buildings began their collapses into their weakest points. The top of the south building tilted 22 degrees into the hole left behind by the plane crash. The, cra the collapse began just above the jet crash point. Richard Gage says that if you were to have a deceptive controlled demolition, quote, you'd start the explosions at the point of jet plane impact. But former controlled demolition employee Tom Sullivan, who believes in controlled demolition of these buildings, says you cannot have controlled demolition in a fire zone. He conjectures that the plane crashes would have to be precisely planned with the demolition starting away from fires, but these collapses were started right in the fires, as Richard admits. If explosives were placed, then they would have been destroyed and damaged by the planes and the fires. Shaped charges are extremely sensitive to geometry. Explosives burn, detonate, or chemically degrade in high heat. Detonators, radio receivers, wiring, and connections between explosives are sensitive components. Controlled demolition crews definitely could not instantly write the 180 million pound building on top, collapsing at high speeds on the floors with the worst fires in mid-course. Unlike in an earthquake, with the Twin Towers, the lateral force or angular momentum of the towers was completely overcome by the greater force of gravity. Here are two boxes duct taped together, and I'm going to put a 22 degree tilt into it just like this. Angular momentum is pushing it in this direction, and if there's enough angular momentum, it will push it all the way over. But on the other hand, gravity is pulling it down, so at 22 degrees, that's what happens. So in this case, not always, but in this case, the angular momentum is overcome by the force of gravity. Of the 14 experts I personally talked with, all but one of them immediately said that because of the fast descent of the whole building, it would have collapsed to the ground before having time to tip over much further. And remember, the entire tower is rotated a few degrees at the onset of the collapse, which is precisely what we expect in a gradual collapse mechanism. If all the supports had failed simultaneously in a controlled demolition, as Richard Gage insists, neither towers would have rotated. The toppling collapse theory requires crushing to be asymmetric, occurring only on one side, which is implausible. The leading edge of the rotating block crushes the structure below, the crushed structure resists, and this reactive force will tend to keep the upper block centered, causing either a downward collapse or no collapse at all. Richard does not seem to take gravity fully into account here. It comes up in other places, too. Does he really think there's not enough gravity in 180 million pounds of building section to overcome angular momentum and then write the structure? He actually tries to eliminate the weight of the upper blocks of both towers, saying that after four seconds it was all dust and had no mass. Well, some mass was lost to dust pulverization, but the top block had plenty of unpulverized mass that made it way down into the debris pile. 10 million pounds of mass is added with each collapsing floor more than making up for the loss of mass due to the gradual pulverization. And let's remember the 2008 Delft University high-speed collapse of a 13-story concrete reinforced steel tower straight down into its own footprint. People high up in the 9-11 truth movement have told me that I get an F in physics for supporting the natural collapse theory because it so obviously violates the laws of physics that every junior high schooler has learned. It's true, I'm no physicist. But physicists and structural engineers helped me extensively with this rebuttal. 
of the 9-11 truth advocates saying that 200 NIST scientists, physicists, engineers, hundreds of college kids who were hired to study each window frame by frame, every major structural engineering body in the world, the faculty at Purdue, Honolulu, a parade of physicists from MIT, and several other schools and scientific institutions who have also studied the collapses are all supporting a document that blatantly violates the most basic laws of physics? Would they all too get Fs, or are they part of a vast misinformation network? The explanations I am putting out here make sense to me. They are grounded in science. And by the way, in school, I aced classes in physics and calculus. If you're familiar with issues around 9-11, you're probably asking yourself, okay, the Twin Towers fell at two-thirds of freefall, but what about Building 7? Even NIST says it came down at around freefall. And you're right. For most of the collapse of the perimeter wall of Building 7, it came down at around two-thirds of freefall. But for eight stories out of those 47, Building 7 did come down at or even slightly faster than freefall. Now there is a 9-11 mystery. For both Richard Gage and for me, I'll explain how a faster than freefall acceleration is possible and just might have occurred in Building 7. And that's a natural collapse scenario that it makes much more sense than the controlled demolition that couldn't possibly exceed freefall. In the meantime, what about Delft?